moderate our first panel discussion, Hacktivism in the Metaverse is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Security Consulting, CEO of Civil International Incorporated, Vice President for Education and Research, Vice President for Education and Research Cloud Security Alliance, the Philippine Chapter, and for more than a decade sharing his wisdom as a part-time professor of De La Salle University and a part-time faculty at DLSU College of St. Daniel. We have... Ooh, we have... Mr. Rickson Ke. Good morning, Sir Rickson. How are you? Yeah, good morning, Carla. Thank you for that generous introduction. And uh, we're really very, very excited. Now, this topic is very, very new. In fact, I don't know any event that has talked about metaverse in full. And we're talking about cybersecurity in the metaverse. And we have a, a, a round of uh, very, very distinguished uh, panel members. Uh, so from global well-known brands no? like Trend Micro, VMware, ExtraHop, and Mandian. So, um, so to kick off our session, right? So uh, we have with us uh, Bijawit, uh, Tokyong, uh, we have Steve and Chris. So to kick off our uh, discussion, this forum, no? I like to ask, because we're talking about activism. No? So I like to ask what... Uh, social issue or uh, what specific uh, social uh, uh, we call that a social cause uh, cause uh, so what social cause would you stand for now probably I'll start off with one myself uh, so I want to stand for stand up for peace uh, and justice uh, so so can we so as we call your name just tell us which company you are representing and your social cause. Would that be good? And for our audience, please also share your social cause that you like to stand up for. We have the chat box. Please feel free to share your social cause. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Bijuwit from uh, Trend Micro. Uh, Bijuwit. Hi, hi. I'm Bijuwit from Micro. And uh, uh, one social cause that has been very close to my heart and I have been working for is... Uh, is education and i believe in a right to education for everybody because somehow i feel going down in the future it is a solution to a lot of problems including peace and all the problems that we have in today's world so yeah thank you for that mr wajit and then uh, let's proceed to tokyo um yeah my name is tokyo from vmware oh uh, similarly as well i've always believed education as the greatest equalizer in social life uh, everybody needs to access to education, not only from a young age, uh, getting all the necessary information, but also in the corporate world as well. Everybody needs to be uh, have the access to the right information, maybe specifically from a security perspective as well, into understanding what's right and what's wrong, what is good behavior and what's bad behavior. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Tokyo. And then let's proceed to Steve. Yeah. Hi, hi Rick. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, I think, you know, addressing some of the challenges around uh, poverty and, and, and hunger and some of, you know, the most disadvantaged, um, you know, who face really, really difficult challenge. I, I think that's something that's close, close to my heart. Education, I would agree with as well. It's a, um, and I like how you framed it as an equalizer. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that, Steve. And finally, last but not the least, Chris. So, well, first, I think probably identity theft is something that I'm you know, quite worried about. It looks like maybe Steve and I have had a, our identity <laughs> switched. Oh, there we go. We're back again. There we go. All right. So we fixed one problem. That's good. Um, yeah, education and just human rights and equality. I think we're seeing lots of different areas of the world at the moment regressing in some ways from you know where they've come in uh, establishing human rights and sort of going backwards. So I think we need to make sure that we don't let that deterioration continue and make sure that you know, we maintain the you know, the rights that have been fought for over so many years. Yeah, thank you for that, Chris. And uh, notice in the chat box, we have already a lot of uh, responses from our audience sharing their social cause. So with that, uh, let's kick off our discussion with 
just a quick, quick uh, presentation. So I like to just give everyone the same uh, denominator of understanding of our topic. So um, hacktivism, it's made out of two root words of uh, hacking and activism. So it's a uh, you know, term as the misuse of computer and internet to expose believed injustice. So, so we have can be politically motivated, can be socially motivated or religiously motivated. So, but with that, uh, if you look at the trend right now, you have a lot of groups. Uh, these are the well-known groups, but even locally, we have the Batangas Go. We have the, you know, the Pinoy Luz Tech group. So there are a lot that are also present in the Philippines. So it's not just because these are the global brands of uh, activism, but locally there are also. And mind you, just the recent war of Russia and Ukraine, the Ukraine government activated this uh, activism call to invite people to join their IT army. So now, hacktivism has evolved in itself. Uh, and that's why it's a very, very good discussion for us to include uh, uh, what are the trends uh, in the area of hacktivism. But, uh, but I think we would like to start with the... Uh, the quote of Niccolo Machiavelli. Okay? So he said, the end justifies the means. No? So we would like to ask our panel group, no? do you believe or do you subscribe to the end justifies the means? So let's start with uh, Tokyo. Um, I've always thought that, uh, well, I believe in the spirit of that quote in the sense that uh, basically if the end outcome is very important to you, then you have to work hard in terms of achieving the outcome itself. But to take it literally, whereby uh, if uh, any means is a good justification to the ends, I think that's, that's I don't I don't I don't agree with that at all. Uh, so I would have, most likely I'll look at it the other way is that basically uh, understanding what you want to achieve as a business outcome and as a or any outcome that you want to achieve, and then looking at all the different uh, methods of achieving that. And then finding one that best meets uh, the the, uh, the the social norms in terms of achieving outcome. I think that's what's, what's necessary here. Yeah. So it's not the total subscription to it. No. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for that, Tokyong. Uh, let's get the insight of Biswaji. Biswaji. Thanks, Rasin. So uh, I would I would also agree uh, uh, on that because I would not agree with the comment, but I would agree with my fellow speaker. Uh, we work, so all of us work in uh, companies, right, uh, and brands, and we have to attain numbers. But all of us have to do it ethically. We cannot uh, attain numbers in a non-ethical function. Similarly, when people do education, right, they have to give the exam, study well, and do it ethically, right? Just getting a top result by any means is not uh, applicable, right? So I think in this means also, uh, I would... Uh, I would uh, say that it is not actually uh, correct uh, because then I would justify a protest turning into a mob violence and you cannot differentiate between the two then, right? So it's very important that uh, uh, the means is important, but how you get to that means is also very important, right? So, yes. So thank you for that, Ms. Majid. And uh, let's go for Steve's insight. Yeah, I think outcomes are obviously important. You, you have to be focused on the outcome. But I would say I probably don't believe that the means justify the ends uh, because I don't believe that that works. Uh, if you have that sort of philosophy, you're maybe allowing yourself to take shortcuts. Uh, maybe you're allowing yourself to do something unethical, maybe even something malicious. And I think the damage that comes out of those means that you've given yourself permission to do to reach that end might end up causing a, a net decrease in the outcome that you're trying to get in the first place. So I think the uh, those means are, are quite important. Finally, Chris, your uh, stand towards Nicolo Micavieri. Well, I have to say, as a cybersecurity consultant and advisor, not an ethics professor, um, my position is, yeah, I'm helping to protect organizations from cyber attack. And if we have a, a free-for-all where we promote the idea that the 
you know, the ends you know, to support the means, then it's, you know, we're going to cyber Wild West even more so than we are now. So I think that definitely we need to have controls and there need to be established norms so that organisations can actually focus what they need to do to you know, stay in business and produce their um, you know, shareholder value in their customers rather than just becoming sort of cybersecurity vigilantes. Yeah, thank you for that, Chris. So you know, subscribe to Batman, no? the vigilante. No? So we no. are no, very straightforward with, um, no, because most people, I, the reason why we raise this question is most people say that when they are caught by authorities, you know, I'm doing this for a cause, I'm doing this for the people and all this. No? So, but without considering no, the implications to the general community. But of course, uh, a follow-up question in line with this is when where do you now draw that line? That you know, hacktivism, okay, which part of hacktivism we wherein you draw the line that this is not right anymore? Uh, because uh, uh, as we all know, when we talk about uh, what what products do you put into your network, uh, there's no right or wrong answer. No, there's just what we call the, you know, best practice approach and all these. No, so there's no right or wrong answer. But still, no? in terms of, uh, you know, ethics, again, it's also a debate. Okay, black or white. No? So usually it's a debate. But now the question is, where do you draw the line that it's not a debate anymore? That this is really wrong. So which part do you draw the line? Let's start with Biswaji. So, so if you are talking about even cybercrime, uh, the the uh, the way we draw the line is: is it following the local laws or it is it in a breach of the local laws of the government or laws of the land? I think that's clearly differentiated. Uh, if it is breaking the law of the land, that means you have crossed the line. If it does not break, uh, it uh, it does not. So I, I I would stick to that that you you have to follow the local laws, and that might change from country to country. But whichever country you are doing business in and belong to, or your organization is, it's very important that we follow the laws of that particular land. Yeah. Okay. Perfectly said. Huh? Let's now go to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Tokyo. What's your uh, side of uh, where do you draw the line? Um. I mean, if you think about this, right? So from uh. I mean, well, regardless of the message that the, the original intent and the message that they want to show, uh, basically from, a, let's say, for example, from a cybersecurity perspective, right? if the end outcome is they want to show that basically this company is unethical, uh, where I draw the line is basically is uh, whereby uh, the message being brought across introduces uh, an impact to innocent lives, innocent uh, bystanders who basically all the co collateral damage that comes with it, I think it would be wrong, basically. I mean, there will be a different ways if to be able to bring the message across without having to dam have all these collateral, collateral damage in between as well. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Steve, where do you draw the line? Yeah, I think one, one easy place to draw the line is you can look at the message validity, right? Is this true? And, and people will argue, is this true or not true? But another aspect you can look at is, is the message source authentic? A lot of times with hacktivists and, and particularly information operations, we see people promoting messages, pretending to be coming uh, from a perspective or pretending to have a certain nationality that they're not having. So when that message is inauthentic in its source and in, inauthentic in how it's portraying itself, that, that for me is a, a clear line being crossed. Okay. And finally, Chris, uh, where do you now draw yeah. the line? So I think Steve hit the nail on the head there regarding the authenticity of the messaging and, you know, is it actually being driven by the ideology of who you think it is, or is it some sort of uh, message coming from puppets or masters in the background? But just to add, I'm based here in Singapore. So for me, the, the line is very firmly drawn for me. So I don't have to worry about <laughs> too much. Okay. So, but in summary, of course, we really have to draw the line. Now, it doesn't have to be an open uh, acceptance on such uh, acts. And uh, I like what 
which Wajit has also mentioned in terms of geographical areas. Because when we now apply ethics in different cultures and different communities, they differ. And now that's where the difficulty lies. In some culture, it's acceptable. In some, it's offending. So that is really a good area that we have to abide by. We have to respect uh, the laws of the land. And uh, we have to also respect the individual rights. Uh, so that is, those are the areas. Uh, and of course, now we will now take in the questions. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A box. And uh, you are also free to comment on some of the questions and on the chat box. And you can also share your answers if you like to be part of our discussion. So let's take the first question from Judy Villanueva. If this is one is directed to Biswajit. Okay? Uh, how is Trend Micro different with other XDR or extended detection response? And one of the pain points on our end are the creation and translation of the report. So they're having difficulty with that and they like to understand the XDR, the differences, and what does Trend Micro offers? Yeah, so I would not use this. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I would give the answer to this question, but uh, I would not use this platform to say my competitors are bad. Some of them are doing a very good job here uh, as well. But yeah, how does Trend Micro do it? So one one point that so it's an evolution, right? Uh, so when Trend Micro uh, launched EDR, we found a need, and we have been one of the first people who came up with this XDR. So when the first time uh, EDR launched in, we saw a problem of correlation, etc. We saw that multi points are required. So we came across multiple sensors in depth. And that's why we are, I think, one of the few vendors who can give it on network, endpoint, email, server natively. Uh, that's a short answer. Uh, now, coming back to your second part of the pain point is the biggest pain point that we find across is who writes those correlation rules, who creates those uh, detection models, how do you go about doing that? Keeping it up to date is the biggest challenge. And across all these points, mind you, this is where trend comes in. And what now trend has done is changed the whole paradigm from a detection and response piece to a risk management piece. So typically, if I see vulnerabilities on your machine, if I see attacks on your machine or malicious activity on your machine, your identity risk score and your device risk score goes high. So now, as a CEO or a CIO or a security office, you can see your identity-based risk, your device-based risk, or your enterprise-based risk rather than think, looking at things in small, small silos. And I think coming into that, coming into report, uh, has solved a lot of problems for our customers. Thank you for answering that, Viswajit. And uh, let's now proceed to the next question. I think we would uh, forward this question to Chris. Uh, what is your take on Goodwill hack? They might be disguised as modern Robin Hood. Oh, I'm not familiar with Goodwill hack. What's someone stealing from the rich to give to the poor? I think that goes back to our hacktivism discussion earlier around where drawing the line. So clearly any sort of theft is against the law and against, uh, you know, Local principles are across international borders as well. So no, I'm, I'm not for it. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. Now, so I think they were saying that this was all about Robin Hood, that you're stealing from the rich and giving it to the poor. And again, that's what we have discussed a while ago. Yeah. It's like uh, it's being covered, right? Well, so stealing, stealing. So <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> still stealing. So I agree with you, you know, with that area. So uh, next is... Um, we have now uh, uh, a difficult question, but I like to put this difficult question to Steve. No? Uh, with due respect, Steve, now what are the ethical considerations in the metaverse? So we're now entering a discussion of activism and the metaverse. But when you now go to the metaverse, what ethical considerations would you look at? Uh, can you unmute? What ethical considerations in the metaverse? 
yes. I, I think it's a Sorry, broad I'm... question, uh, Steve, but probably we can lock into when you now journey into the metaverse, what do you consider as uh, you know, morally acceptable actions? Like uh, in general for a corporate company or for a company entering the metaverse, uh, what would be the ethical considerations? I think maybe the top one is around privacy. I think as we've seen the internet grow and expand and, and become more sophisticated, there's been, <laughs> excuse me, there's been more data collection on uh, the digital citizens and uh, there's a lot of concern around privacy. And so I think uh, one of the things we need to look at carefully as the metaverse evolves are, what are we being asked to provide in terms of personal information? How is that information being stored and collected? And ultimately, how is it being used and, and who is it being shared with? So I agree with that. No, there were a number of questions a while ago um, talking about identity, how to protect your identity in the metaverse, about data privacy on the metaverse. And I think, Steve, you have said that. No, So the respect for no, data and privacy in the metaverse is a good start when we talk about ethics. right? And uh, now there's another challenging question. And of course, uh, I'll give this to Tokyong. Mm -hmm. um, what are the social controls of metaverse for data privacy? Wow, this is really a tough one. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to give you that, Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but at the end of the day, I think uh, there are some predefined rules. Uh, uh, for example, in certain countries, there are some predefined rules in terms of some of the information that can and should be shared. So I think we should follow what's the laws within that country or within that. Uh, the region itself. So that one, that's one way we can follow to make sure that basically the amount of information we share conforms or the amount of information that uh, uh, that uh, the is the it's collected conforms within that rules and regulations. So I think the key thing is that what what's the rules and regulations within that country itself. Yeah. So well said, well said. Uh, um, the social controls work hand in hand with the legal infrastructure of a country, mm -hmm. and I believe in itself, we have to understand there are various controls, not just technical, not just on the people's side, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, the legal layer. And all these work hand in hand. And mm -hmm. uh, for us to be successful in, uh, uh, in preserving peace in our communities, in, in cyberspace, we have to consider all of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. And um, now let's go back to the discussion of hacktivism on the metaverse. Uh, um, what, how does hacktivism now impact the metaverse and emerging technologies? Now you have IoT, you have the cloud, mobile, and all these, and then uh, you have the meta. So each time there's a new technology, hacktivism or, or the general cyber attack uh, adopts to that technology. But this time around, how do you think would hacktivism be engaged in the metaverse? Like, do you see now these people who are in AR, VR, you have the 3D you know, image of these people doing the you know, activist uh, rallies online? So how do you think hacktivism and these people would take advantage of the metaverse? Uh, so let's start with Chris. Chris? Uh, you can be imag imaginative. No, everyone has doesn't have to be very specific. Yeah. We can be creative as we can because you know we haven't defined the the, the look and form of the metaverse yet. No, but Chris, and I think yeah, I think so. With metaverse, it's to begin with, it's you know it's a new social, it's a new online location for people to gather. Right. So we started off with back in the day bulletin boards. Right. Bulletin boards started off, and they started off with very good and general and nice purposes, but get corrupted by you know, the bad elements of society. We see the same thing with MySpace, with Facebook, with Twitter, with Telegram, right? With all the different online platforms that we generate, while they're initially created for good, inevitably they sort of turn to the bad, right? And they get misused by or used by the bad actors to put forward their message. So I think it's inevitable that we'll see the same in the metaverse. I think Today, you know, the adoption of metaverse is quite low. It's quite niche, right? So we see as people start using it more and as more people become involved in it, I think there's no doubt we will see 
um, hacktivism attempts in the metaverse, but I guess it depends on who's the audience, right? Who's going to see it in the metaverse? You know, if, if a tree falls in the wood and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound, right? The metaverse would be a bit like that with hacktivism inside the metaverse. No one's there to see it. You know, what sort of effect will actually have on society? Yes, thank you for that, Chris. And I like I like what you said that, um, you know, it's what the people, you know, the target audience of this hacktivism or these cyber attacks. So if they're moving en masse into the metaverse, definitely the hackers will follow. Uh, so it's it's right now, it's given as such. So uh, uh, Viswaji, um, your insight. Yes, so uh, typically if you look at these uh, hacktivists, what they try to do is they try to be paid, they try to put that message. So as you said, uh, the creative juices should come out. So. Uh, for example, we are doing a metaverse event, let's say hypothetically, and some vulnerability is getting exploited and they are able to come inside and they are able to hack all our screens and they are able to pass on their message rather than we having this panel discussion, for example. Uh, so yes, so I would uh, say that uh, there are multiple uh, possibilities that, have, that can happen. Uh, and, uh, and and there are multiple things that I can think of even that can happen and that can start for, and I think the weaknesses are usual. Uh, there might be some things which are very, very catered to metaverse, but mostly it is seems the identity gets stolen, the privacy getting stolen, the vulnerability is getting exploited. So it's typically the same thing. And when they are able to take access over or take over and do stuff, yeah. So are, are you tired of it already, Miss Majid? It's the same thing, even if the mode is different. It's the same over and over. You know, you have people uh, uh, not educated properly. You have this uh, human error, and then you have these unpatched systems and all these. No? So it's the same thing. But even with a new platform, it's still the same. No? Like we have, you have mentioned. No? So that does that make you tired? <laughs> And not be interested in the metaverse anymore. No, the, see the form factor changes, but typically it is just the form factors which are changing, right? And the more connected we are getting, the more digitalized we are getting. Uh, like for example, for the last two years, we wanted, we did not want it, we have adopted a complete digital lifestyle, right? And now when things are normal, it is not normal like before. We all accept, right? So this is the new norm, and we have. Uh, uh, accepted it and so and so the attack surface increases so the attack surface increases does mean that uh, uh, the attacks would happen and then we have to keep on our we have to be there and doing this job all the time yeah, to be defensive about it uh, so I agree I agree uh, so uh, it's a thankless job but uh, we get the job done if there's no one complaining we're doing a good job right so Steve um, uh, in terms of uh, how do you see now hacktivism taking form in the metaverse? Yeah, I think I think we're on the right track. It, it really comes down to motivation, right? So it, when we look at the motivations of different cyber threat actors, you've got the espionage actors, the nation state actors, you've got the financially motivated threat actors, and then you have the hacktivist uh, threat actors. And typically the hacktivist threat actors are... Uh, looking for to uh, initiate or or promote some sort of change, and they often do that through uh, defacement. So you can imagine what defacement might look like in a virtual reality world or an augmented reality world. Uh, the other thing they tend to do is uh, DDoS attacks, right? So uh, disruptive services or maybe even destructive services, uh, destructive attacks in, in some cases. So I think the motivation is there, the methods are there, and you know, as as said previously it's it's just following on to the new platform a lot of what we've seen already but it'll manifest in more compelling and more creative ways uh, thank you for that steve you know, because i'm imagining already if you are defaced if your avatar has been defaced and it was changed to you know like uh, money highs huh? everybody watch that everybody love that no, but it's a, a different form of uh, threat. No? But uh, so moving forward, we have uh, Tok Yong as uh, yeah. you know, how creative can we can the metaverse be in terms of the hacktivists? No, so so I think uh, we we can look at it from two perspectives, right? Uh, the activism part of it, 
usually is subjected to a lot of debates, ethical discussions and things like that. So uh, we do need to understand some of this rationale or why people do certain things, the message they're trying to bring across. But the hacking part of it is a little bit more clear, right? The, the hacking part of it is a little bit more uh, scientific in nature, right? So that's where security practitioners like us, I think, uh, regardless of what the message is, our primary goal is still to be able to observe, being able to detect all the hacking that is going, the, how the threat actors is going to gain access to all the information. How are they going to be able to compromise your systems? All these are, I think, the, the highest priority in terms of where a security practitioner's point of view is supposed to focus on. And then once we have that in place, regardless of what kind of uh, message that they're trying to bring across, at least we have the first line of defense to be able to understand how they're doing this, what they're doing, and then to prevent that thing from happening. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Tokyo. So uh, we'll get some more questions from the audience and uh, we have some directed questions. So um, we have one for Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, is VMware platform can all be integrated with SOAR? So we'll just squeeze in uh, some of the questions. Ah, okay. So I think uh, SOAR, I think basically has the capability to accept uh, a, a log messages inputs from all the different products out there. So VMware products definitely basically uh, actually is able to send out all these logs, event information to SOAR for the further level of processing. Definitely, we do support uh, the, as the, the different source solutions are in the market today. Okay, I hope Roman Castro were able to answer that. So, we have another question by Rafael Acejo. Um, this question we like to direct this to Chris uh, because of his product. Uh, how will the AI in IDS will aid in the realm of metaverse? Does it detect 100% the external and internal threats? If not 100%, what is the best way? Well, nothing's ever 100%, so I'll start off by saying that. Um, there's, no, you know, there's no guarantees in life, so that's still the same in cybersecurity. The best we can do is take the data inputs that we've got, and that's where, you know, especially in the NDR space, where extra hop sits, where we look at all of the network traffic and focus more on the internal communications, what we refer to as the east-west communications, right? As I said in my presentation, that idea of finding an attacker once they've been able to penetrate the perimeter and what they're doing inside the organization. Now, whether you treat the metaverse as being another potential access point into the organization and you're looking at protecting the organization from attack and from disruption or from ransomware based on using metaverse as that access point, or if you're looking at security within the metaverse itself, I mean, I think that, that's probably going to be a bit of an existential question because it's like, how do you do security within Facebook, right? Well, Facebook does that. So it's not like us as other organizations are going to be able to do much security inside the metaverse unless we see the combination of different metaverses. Right? We're talking about Microsoft with their metaverse potentially, um, Facebook or Meta with their metaverse, obviously. And we need to see what kind of interaction we're going to see between different universes. So I think that's still sort of up for, up for exploration, up for debate as to how the uh, different communities are going to actually interact, integrate together. So I think most of them are scrambling. No? So Facebook doesn't want to be known as Facebook anymore. They want to be known as Meta. So mm -hmm. everybody knows that. They're trying to brand their own uh, universe now. And uh, they're scrambling, no? much like the domain squatters we had uh, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, they're now starting that, that you know, claim on their own universes. And uh, it's very interesting to see that. And then, you know. So we have one comment as well. Uh, we have one comment from, let me read that, from Mavic Pineda, uh, directed to Steve. No, She wants to react to uh, Steve. For most actors, players in meta Metaverse, nobody wants to give their true information. So they try to mask. Uh, and they prefer, prefer to have several aliases and in a nominee. On the other hand, how do you approach this in uncovering the data needed when there is a cyber crime. So how well, what Mavic was saying is, if there is really now a need for the court to identify these people, no, like no digital signatures of the meta, no, so we, we don't know. No? So what's your insight? Like how creative can you suggest Mavic? Uh, what do, can we expect? 
Yeah. So a lot of the you know the com tech companies will do lawful uh, interception or through warrants, be able to get some of the back end records from the tech companies when there's something that needs to be followed up. But I think it's a good point. <laughs> Attribution in the internet and in the metaverse, consequentially, uh, is very difficult. And this is part of why we talked earlier about what about ethical hackers? What about goodwill hackers? Um, this is why it's difficult. You may be thinking you're retaliating against someone who uh, is malevolent in some way, but it's hard to know who is who on the internet and it's easy to get attribution wrong. And the server that you're attacking, which you may think is attacking you, may actually be a compromised infrastructure of an innocent third party. So it's, it's really difficult uh, to do that, but law enforcement has special ways to get information. And as new platforms come into play, um, you know, the lessons of the past have been learned and a lot of these architecturally are easier to do. So I think we can anticipate uh, that there'll be greater visibility and control in that area as we move into the metaverse. Yes, thank you for that, Steve. No? So you cannot, if you cannot identify, you cannot prosecute. And in the eyes of the law, if you cannot identify, um, the law would not be able to function. No? So I, I agree with that question. So um, I think we are now on the last leg. I'd I like to ask from each one of our panel, distinguished panel team, um, what's your uh, um parting words in terms of uh, how would our audience be ready or prepare for the metaverse in the whole cybersecurity sense of it. Let's start with this, Wajit. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the way I would put it is uh, it's a new platform. New platforms have been coming. We saw uh, in the last 10, 20 years from physical to virtual to cloud to microservices. Uh, and then we saw about the SaaS applications coming up from on-premise, et cetera. So the form factor has changed. Threats have also been changed, adjusting with the form factors. And security has also changed based on that. Uh, so I would say that uh, there is no reason to worry, but of course, uh, uh, everybody, securities, uh, vendors, uh, organization, governments have to scale up to meet these new challenges and these new vectors of threat. Uh, and it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing challenge that keeps uh, all of us security professionals uh, uh, driving and uh, wanting for more and, and protect you more because across all the attack surfaces. Thank you for that, Biswajit. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, go next to Tokyo. Well, I think for me, the key thing is uh, the mindset change. Uh, um, basically, I think a parameter defense or having security controls at the parameter will only go so far. I think we need to change our men's mindset in terms of we don't just want to prevent attacks from coming in. We still have to be prepared when, when attacks or um, malicious software does passes through your parameter and enters in your system. What are the ways and means do you have within the infrastructure, within the data center? What kind of controls do you have there that can help you detect some of these things that goes on within the data center and help you mitigate such attacks? I think that's the mindset that we need to change to, the ability to understand that, uh, well, it's not, it's not about trying to prevent anything from the end. It's the ability to react to whatever situation there is. And the best way to do this is to take a look at in the data center itself, applying the zero trust concept in terms of making sure whatever you do, everything, trust nothing, and everything has to be verified. And then from there, you should be able to then be able to have a more holistic approach in terms of how you protect your infrastructure, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you're going to build all your metaverse applications on, and also all the users are accessing this infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, let's now proceed to Chris, your parting uh, words. Chris? Yeah, thank you. So I think the, the key thing is you know, echoing, as I said in my presentation, that it's important to be aware of the metaverse and be aware of the opportunities that it's going to bring and the risks that it's going to bring, but also don't get completely distracted. Right? In the security field, in IT in general, we're very good at chasing the new shiny object, right? Getting, you know, chasing the new squirrel in the backyard kind of thing. And we forget about what we were doing already. And as we've seen, attacks today are still successful. We're seeing ransomware campaigns being very successful and causing a lot of disruption and a lot of cost to organizations. So we can't take our eye off the ball and just focus on you know, the future 
right? Because undoubtedly the metaverse will be part of our future and what we need to deal with, but we still need to focus on the controls that we have today and make sure our environments are resilient to the current threats as well. So thank you for sharing that, Chris. Uh, so remember, shiny new technology. Uh, and uh, you know, let's not be distracted with that. No? So metaverse, if we treat it like any of the emerge technology that we have went through our whole lifetime, the internet, the introduction of mobile, the introduction of cloud, uh, we should be able to prepare. No? So the words of wisdom from Steve. Yeah, I guess I would say um, let's take a look at some of the things that are happening now. They're they're really interesting, right? So we see, for example, business email compromise happening with uh, digital deepfakes of audio to help compel and socially engineer people into making payments to, to places they shouldn't make. Uh, a few weeks ago, the FBI just released a report of remote workers who were using video deepfakes to apply for remote work positions um, for the purposes of getting access to those companies and stealing their data for espionage. So a lot of these things are already halfway playing out today. You can imagine a situation in the metaverse where people are using some of the same sort of techniques and coming with the same intentions, and uh, it'll make for really interesting times uh, coming soon. Thank you for that words of wisdom, Steve. No, so um, oh, we still have some questions pouring in. I'm, I'm, I apologize, but we will try to answer them uh, as we can still uh, uh, have access to the Q&A box. Um, but again, everyone, thank you for this very, very interactive. Huh? So we really love the audience interacting with us. And again, uh, fine gentlemen from Global Brands. Huh? So we have Bris Wajit. Uh, Tokyo, Chris, and Steve. Uh, let's give them a virtual round of applause for our uh, uh, for our panel members. And uh, as always, no, we have to be safe both physical and online. So uh, to summarize everything, it's a new technology. It's up to us to define what the metaverse will be for us. But we always consider security by design. No? So security has to be embedded already while we're building this new universe we want to live in. So with that, I want to thank everyone.